It's just another night for Supernatural Girls. Real stories, real answers to life's biggest supernatural mysteries. And now for another exciting interview with paranormal experts from this world and others. Here's your host, paranormal researcher Patricia Baker, on the one, the only, Supernatural Girls. Welcome, everybody, to another exciting show of Supernatural Girls Radio. I am your host, Patricia Baker. I am here with my co-host all the way from Tucson, Patricia Kirkman. PK, how are you tonight? Absolutely fabulous and cannot wait for our special guest tonight. Oh, my God. This show is going to be the most exciting show ever, don't you think? I think so. I have to agree with you. Yes, it will be. I am certain of that. Now, we're, we're not going to do too much, you know, chitter-chatter like we normally do because this guest has so much to share with us tonight. So we're going to talk about the numbers because it looks like all hell's breaking loose with North Korea and other things. So what's going on? What do we have to look out for tonight and tomorrow? Well, I think the most important part is this is a new month. Let's just talk about the month instead of the days. The month itself deals with everybody wanting something to be perfect. We know that that doesn't work. And too many people are trying to uh, put their nose into positions that they're not supposed to be, which is going to create some backlash. That might be part of what we're seeing on the world stage. But for the most part, it's all about family, family family-type situations, and really working in a way that's more positive but alternative medicines, alternative avenues, anything that we could find on the alternative side will work very well for us. If we try to go the old conventional route, we're going to have some major problems. Well, that sounds reasonable to me. I'm always for the alternative way. So that sounds like a plan. I like it. I I like it a lot. Direct to the point. That's what we've got going on right now. And there's nothing that's going to change this at this point in time. It's just get on the wagon and ride the course. All right. We're going to ride. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to let everybody know we are now on video. Yeah. So how about it? Our audience can now watch us as we talk to them and to each other. And what they need to do is go to the chat room, irnchat.com. That's irnchat.com. Click on the menu and click on tube. And if you do that, you're going to be able to see us. How cool is that? You can see all three of us tonight. So I'm excited to share our our little faces with the rest of our audience. You can still write questions in the chat room. We will ask them of our guests tonight on your behalf. And also, we do have some terrific stories on our Facebook page. We have a trail cam shot of a little girl. Is it a little girl? That's the question. Is it a ghost, a little girl, or a black-eyed kid? We want to hear from you. What do you think it is? Go to our Facebook page. Take a look. And Kurt Russell, he's come out of the closet and said he had a UFO experience with his son. So he has announced that to the world. Hooray. Thank you, Kurt, for sharing that with the rest of us. So it's good to hear from people who are celebrities and have had these experiences and aren't afraid to come out and tell people about it. Right? I think it's important that we share the information we have. Too many people have been fearful because of being put down by their neighbors or friends or family members. You know, let's face it, anybody today that does something that is considered a little bit off color, the whole world goes a little crazy over it. Well, yeah, that's got to come to a stop. We're sick of it. You know, all of the people that we know, all of the friends we have that are true abductees that have had these UFO encounters, you know, we open our hearts to them. We love these people because they've had the courage to come out and talk about it. Travis Walton, Betty Andreas, and Bob Luca, you know, they're all a part of our tribe here. They've all been on the show. They've all come and shared their truth, and that's what it is. It's the truth. But tonight, we are honored, I mean honored, to have with us a great guest, John Edmonds. And, you know, I, I love the fact that John's going to come on and talk about his 
alien ranch experiences. But you know what I love the most about John? He has a heart as big as he is. He big. is all heart, don't you think? I think at least bigger. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and it's great. It is so great to have somebody on the show with such a big heart. John, besides all the other things that he's involved with, he has a charity. And I'm going to announce this right now because it's really important. Now that we have everybody's attention, the name of it is called Hopeful Hooves, H-O-O-V-E-S, dot org. It is a 501c3, and I want to urge everybody in our audience to donate to this charity. It is to save the horses that have been abandoned out in the Arizona desert. I mean, John has taken this upon himself. He's also saved dogs that have been left out in the desert to die. I mean, this is a great man. And please, let's all help him and his wife with the great work that they're doing to help these animals. It's very expensive to feed these horses. And it's very expensive if they need medical care. So I'm asking everybody in the audience, please send whatever you can, even if it's five dollars. Uh, you can you can send that. You can go right to John's website, which is alienranch.weebly w e e b l y dot com, and I'm going to put that on our site as well, right. so people can find it. And you can find a place there to donate. Um, you can contact John from that page. Also, if you want to just send a check. To the ranch, but you'd be doing a great thing and helping out because there, there's nobody else really doing the work he's doing, as far as I know, with these horses. So we got to help him out, everybody. So let's do it. All right. Great idea. So let's, let's get John on this show. I can't wait to yes. talk to this guy. My God, this is great. Well, John Edmonds of the Alien Ranch, also known as the Stardust Ranch, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. You've been through so much. My goodness, there's so much to talk about tonight, so much to learn. And, again, we're just honored that you're with us. Uh, tell us, again, a little bit about the beginning of the story, because I know this was your dream property. This is what you you left Phoenix for, was to come. We actually left the Midwest for, right? Chicago area well, to come out. Yeah, actually what happened was is that I uh, – I am originally from Evanston, Illinois, uh, right up next to Northwestern University. Uh, and, you know, I all my life growing up in Chicago and Evanston, I always watched, you know, WGN, the Superstation, even before it was a Superstation. And they always had cowboy, you know, TV shows on Saturday and Sunday mornings. And so I'd get up and I'd watch, you know, the, the Lone Ranger and I'd watch, you know, all these different, you know, Rawhide and all these different shows. And I thought, man, that's the greatest thing in the world. I want to have horses. I want to have a ranch. You know, I didn't really want to be a cowboy. I just wanted to have horses. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I, I asked my mom and I, my dad and I said, why can't we move to Arizona? And they said, well, you know, <laughs> we live in Evanston. We're not going to go out there. And I said, but we could have horses out there. And they're like, too bad, no horses. And I said, well, what is it going to take for me to get horses? And they said, you're going to have to get a really good job. You're going to have to save your money, and you're going to have to wait until you're old enough to do it. <laughs> well, I, I, I took that absolutely at heart, and I started you know, getting paper routes. I started taking back soda bottles and you name it, whatever I could do. I was out there hustling you know, all over as hard as I could and saving the money. I, I worked as a golf caddy, you name it, whatever I could do, wash cars, you know, paint numbers on curbs, it didn't matter what it was. And I saved up a heck of a lot of money. And finally, when I got to the point where I thought I had enough, I uh, decided to come out and go to school at Arizona State University and get my degrees. And so I did that. And in the process, uh, you know, I decided after that, I started getting good jobs. And I thought, hey, this is it. I'm going to finally have horses. And uh, my wife and I got together, and we decided that, you know, okay, my wife kind of put up with it, and she was from Wisconsin, and her <laughs> one thing in her whole life was, I don't want to live on a dairy. So I was like, well, it's not a dairy, it's horses, they're different. And That's so right. she kind of grudgingly went along with it, and uh, we ended up, you know, walking around, looking at all these properties out here. We finally found Stardust Ranch. Of course, it wasn't Stardust Ranch back then. And, uh, you know, we bought it. I paid cash for it, and I thought, this is my dream. I'm finally going to have horses. 
And, uh, you know, we were here uh, June 1st of 1996, and from the very first day that we moved in here, things went crazy. Uh, the people that we bought the ranch from didn't move out. Uh, in fact, they just took the cash, and they were like, uh, move out? What do you mean? And uh, we literally had to, you know, make arrangements to uh, move in late. And when we went to move in, we found all their stuff in the pool, a big, big diving pool behind the house. And we had nothing to do with it. We weren't even there. And as far as I know, the realtor wasn't involved. So I have no idea how it happened, and they never told us, and we never saw them again. So now, all was we there know stuff? Is, I, I have a question for you about that. Was sure. there stuff, like, neatly piled up? In the swimming pool, or was it just thrown into the swimming pool? It was just thrown in. I mean, just it was like in. appliances, appliances, and you name it. And this is good it. stuff, huh? This is good I, stuff. This was, yeah. I mean, well, this was like, you know, I felt bad. I mean, you know, I was angry because of what happened. But at the same time, I thought to myself, you know, this is their stuff. I'm not going to try to keep it or anything. So I, I got a winch and hooked it up to my truck and pulled everything out of the pool that was too big for me to lift. And then I took it and put it out front. And people came and took it. It disappeared. So I don't know what happened to it, but somebody used it. So that was mystery number one. Well, they showed that the very first day. Okay. After not Sorry. letting you move in, it was only fair that you, they had to go through a bit of an upset themselves. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I just, from day one, things were strange. And... Mm -hmm. You know, the uh, following weekend uh, elapsed. My wife went back to work. I started calling the phone company to get a phone hooked up, and it was like crazy trying to get a phone out here. Uh, nobody wanted to come out to the ranch. And they kept making appointments with me, and nobody would show up. And after about the third appointment, I finally got on the, on the uh, you know, my uh, cell phone, and I called them, and I said, look, guys, you know, I need a phone, a regular landline. I'm going to need to be able to have uh, Internet service, all that kind of stuff. You know, what is the problem? You guys just can't find the ranch or you just don't really care about your job or what's the problem? And they said, nobody wants to go out there. And I said, well, why not? And they said, well, they're afraid. And I said, afraid? I said, there's just two of us out here. You know, we're nice people. We're from the Midwest. It's not like we've done anything to anybody to scare them. And they said, well, we're going to have to figure it out, but we'll get back to you. So finally, they made an appointment. Somebody came out, and the guy explained everything to me. And he told me about the history of this place. And I, my mouth just hung open. I was absolutely shocked. This place has a really, really dark history. And that's why nobody wanted to come out to put the phone in. They actually had to have, like, uh, draw straws. And, you know, the guy that lost, the guy that lost had to come out. He had to come yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> he had to come out and put the phone in. Oh, you my. know, but he was really nice about it when he got out here, and he explained everything to me, and he apologized, and he said, you know, it's not superstition. There's people that have died on the property. There's, you know, uh, all sorts of horrible stuff has happened out here. And, of course, you know, the realtor never told me any of this. I don't even know that he knew anything about it. But, uh, you know, all the neighbors were afraid of us. They were like, oh, my God, I can't believe those guys bought that place, you know. <laughs> so, you know, we, we just, wow. you know, we just, yeah, we, we were horrified, but, you know, we paid cash, and, you know, yeah, we bought an extended warranty, but it didn't cover aliens, and it didn't cover all the other <laughs> stuff out here. I don't so. know why not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, gee, they should have a warranty for that. Well, now, you also encountered, as I recall, a very interesting character one of your, one of your first few days out there that came yes. wandering up your driveway. Tell us about yes. that. That is the machete man that everybody loves to talk about. Um, I was putting away things in the kitchen and I looked out the window and this kind of disheveled looking man that looked like uh, unfortunately a stereotypical kind of Vietnam veteran with very long hair, uh, you know, uh, army clothes that had been, uh, you know, had the uh, arms, the, the sleeves cut off and the, the pants cut off and, and just, you know, he just kind of looked like a mess. And he had this uh, machete with a leather uh, tong that was attached to it, and he had it wrapped around his right hand, and he just kind of swung it, you know, back and forth, and, and he came right up the driveway like he lived here. And so I thought, wow, this is going to be interesting. And uh, I had uh, 
heard that living in the desert, it's probably a good idea to have at least one handgun or one rifle or maybe one of both. And so I had uh, gone out and purchased a uh, 357 Magnum, and I took that and put it down the back of my pants, kind of gangland style, and uh, walked out <laughs> to meet him. And uh, I said, you know, hi, what are you doing here? And he just looked at me and he says, well, I live here. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, God, here we go. <laughs> you know, and I said, well, uh, what do you do here? And he says, well, I'm the guy that uh, kills the monsters. And I said, monsters? There's some monsters out here. It's in the middle of the desert. There's nothing out here. And he just looked at me and his eyes got real big. And he said to me, there's lots of monsters out here. And I said, okay, so tell me about this. And he says, well, um, I live back there in that, that building back there. And I said, well, that's going to be my tack room. This is going to be a horse ranch. And, uh, you know, if you got your stuff back there, I'd appreciate it if you go back there and gather it up because uh, I don't really need anybody to kill the monsters. You know, and I was just kind of thinking to myself, this is kind of, you know, some scam of a guy that just, you know, wants to kind of squat on the property. And maybe the, the owners hadn't been here very much. And so he got away with it. And I was nice about it. And I told him, I said something about you personally. I just don't think I need anybody to be a monster killer. You know, this <laughs> isn't going to be. You know, this isn't a monster ranch. This is a horse ranch. Little and, did you uh, know. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea, you know. And, and he just looked at me and he smiled and he shook his head like, man, this guy's an idiot. He's going to be really sorry, but too bad for him. And, uh, you know, he, he went back and he got his stuff and he tied up all his junk in a, like a white sheet and kind of, you know, wrapped it up and threw it over his shoulder and came back up to, toward the house where I was. And he just looked at me and he said, well, you're going to be really sorry. And I said, well, I'm already sorry, but I don't want to be any sorrier. And uh, he just shook his head, and he walked off into the sunset, and that was the last I ever saw of him. So you never saw him again. Wow. I've never seen him again. He's been very well portrayed a couple of times with uh, things we've done with TV, but that's the closest we've ever come to seeing him again. And the previous owners, you've never encountered them either, right? They just disappeared. Never, I have no they, idea what happened to them. You know, they, they literally, they worked uh, in the military, and I guess they transferred, or I don't know what happened to them. They just never came back. The interesting thing was, though, that the original owner, I was outside working with the horses one day a few years ago, and the guy who originally built the property back in the 70s drove through the front gates, and, you know, he I had no idea who he was, of course, and he drove up in this white pickup truck, and I walked over and greeted him, and he said, are you the owner? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I'm the guy that built this place. And I just looked at him, and I said, so you're the guy I need to blame for everything that's gone wrong with this place. <laughs> and, and, he, and he just looked at me, and he kind of started looking, and I looked at him, and then he smiled, and I smiled, and then he introduced himself, and I introduced myself. And, you know, he proceeded for like the next hour to tell me all sorts of stories about what happened here. And he gave me photographs of the house and everything as he built it, because he did it himself. He was literally a guy who did custom building, and he built this place because of the fact that he wanted it to, it to be a surprise for his wife. And uh, the day that he brought her out here to present his great surprise, I guess she just about fell over and decided that it was not a good place to live and that she had all sorts of bad feelings about it from an energetic point of view. And she said, I'm not moving out there. I'll divorce you before I'll move out there. Wow. And so, yeah. and so she never moved in. He never moved in. And they ended up just selling this place for whatever they could get for it uh, back about 1978. And uh, mm. that was the beginning of the end. Gosh. So she had bad feelings. Now your wife also had bad feelings. Right? Well, yeah, and I'm not so sure how much of that was about the ranch and how much of it was about me, really. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I really didn't mean to trick her. I, but she never asked me what I wanted to do with my life, you know. And, and uh, you know, I always told her I wanted to write. I wanted to do music again. And, you know, I wanted to do a few different projects. But, you know, I, I, I told her, I said, someday I'd like to have some horses. You know, but I think that went in one ear and went out the other. And so, you know, by the time we got married, you know, she thought, thank God I, I didn't marry a rancher. You know, I married this guy from Evanston, Illinois, right next to Chicago. He's real urban. You know, he, he, no chance am I going to end up on a farm. 
well, as soon as we got married and, you know, I decided that I wanted to, to have horses, one day she just looked at me and she goes, what are you thinking about? And I said, well, I've decided to have a farm. <laughs> 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 you know? and, and she she just, I mean, my wife, I mean, her head practically spun around. I bet it did. You know? <laughs> it's like something out of the exorcist. Oh, I mean, she was God. horrified. You know, and, and, and to have you know, all I didn't mean to. Happen on top of it, I mean, to have well, all these it. experiences, it made you, I'm sure, all feel out of control, and uh, at the mercy of things that were from another universe, literally. Exactly, and see, we didn't, you know, I, I mean, we didn't know any of that stuff coming into this. I mean, we saw lights in the sky, in the south sky. We saw all these, like what we used to call golden orbs. And honestly, when I first saw all that stuff, I thought it was kind of cool. I was like, wow, you know, this is like I'm out here in the middle of nowhere, and, you know, it's kind of spooky. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, right, this, right. this isn't so bad. This is kind of cool. Yeah. And uh, then, unfortunately, bad, really bad things started happening. And we started finding dead animals around the ranch. We started uh, uh, just seeing, you know, bad things and, and started getting real creeped out by it. And... You know, my wife looked at me and she's like, you know, it's bad enough you had to buy a ranch, but then you had to buy this really crappy one that, you know, every, everything's going wrong, you know. And I was just like, you know, so this is what being married's about. And, uh, you know, I, I, I apologize, you know, I apologize profusely. And I, I told her I loved her and I said, I'm sorry. I, how could I possibly know? I mean, it's not like I went out and, you know, lived on a ranch all my life. I didn't know what to look for. It was a good price. You know, nice property, good views, plenty of water. I thought, hey, you know, I, I got this thing nailed. I had no idea what I, you know, stepped in. I mean, I stepped in the dirtiest, nastiest mess that you could ever step in. And well, we've been here yeah, ever since. But, but I have to say, you know, PK and I were talking about you and your wife, and you've really been able to manage a lot of this. Step. But let's right. go back to, to when the bad stuff started to happen to you, because you mentioned your animals. That, that would kill me right there. If anybody touched my animals, I would be out of my mind, and I would be running around with every with weapons hanging off of me. But then it it switched. It became you became the target, right? You and your wife. Well, see, yeah. What happened was is that we started. First of all, I should explain something, and that was that um, I had been working, uh, you know, right up, pretty much right up till that time when we had the ranch. And I had actually got my back broken working at the state hospital here in Arizona. And so I was on disability at the time. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to go out in the desert and see what's out here. Because quite frankly, you look out in the desert around here, you can see 15 to 18 miles, literally, uh, you know, perfectly. I mean, you know, not even with like, you know, uh, uh, glasses or anything, you know. Uh, it, it's just amazing. And so I thought, I'm going to go out and explore. You know, and I've always been kind of an explorer anyway, so that kind of came naturally. And I'd go out in the desert, and I'd find all these horses. And I thought, wow, you know, this is really beautiful. It's out here. And I noticed some of the horses looked really skinny. They didn't look that healthy. And I thought, wow, i got to do something about this. So with my Jeep, I started bringing out bags to feed. And I started feeding the horses. Well, next thing I know, I'm, like, surrounded by horses. I'm, like, the good humor man of horses. And... <laughs> You know, every everybody, every you know, every horse that's like, you know, hungry in the world practically seemed like it was coming up to my Jeep and, you know, getting some food. And so finally I thought, you know what, why if I go horse you know, why buy go out and spend a lot of money and buy horses? You got all these horses right here. Maybe they'd like to come back to the ranch. And so it was about a ten mile, eight to ten mile walk, but for a horse that's not a big walk. And so gradually what I did was is I just started feeding the horses as I drove and they started following me home. And so the whole herd came home with me. And that's how we got horses. But the reason <laughs> I tell you that is because now we have horses on the ranch and, you know, that they're, they're corralled and I'm living my dream and I'm thinking, wow, how cool am I? And uh, next thing I know, some of the horses started getting murdered and it broke my heart. I mean, here I am. I finally got my dream. I got my ranch, you know, and I got it at a good price and I'm clapping myself on the back and I'm trying to ignore my wife is pissed off at me and all this bad stuff's happening but you know I'm still saying hey it's still a dream you're still you did it you know but unfortunately uh, some of the horses got mutilated there was like three horses over about a year 
that something attacked them in their pens and literally, it literally, I mean, it's horrible to say this. Uh, if there's kids listening, cover your ears, but they, they literally went in and they, they pulled the guts out, uh, through the anus of the horse. Oh my they uh, pulled the eyes out. They tore the eyes out. They cut the feet off. I mean, they did horrible things to these horses. And it was very clear that it was not a human being or anybody that I could think of that could ever do this because there was no blood. And the cuts on the horses were absolutely like somebody did it with a laser. I mean, they were absolutely precision cuts. And there was no blood. I mean, all the blood was gone. They were sanguinated. Uh, uh, you know, it's just crazy. And, and you know, the horses have tried mean. desperately. And it's mean. It's like, why, what is it that gives these uh, aliens in their own little minds the right to do this kind of thing? I mean, we care so much about our, our animals. We love them. And obviously, you've gone out of your way to take care of these animals. And then to have these creatures from outer space or wherever the hell they're from come and do that is absolutely unacceptable. That's awful. It, well, you're absolutely right about everything you just said, but what we have found out over the years, and that is there are certain types of malevolent aliens that they get the almost the equivalent of like a cocaine rush off of the tremendous negative energy and emotion that we express as humans. And so they do, they love to do things to, to just, you know, make our lives miserable because of the fact that by doing that, we put out all this, you know, juicy, hormonal, uh, you know, material, and they just manage to absorb it and enjoy it, and that's why they do it. Horrible. Uh, but you'd have to kind of read down the story of ways to have that information, I mean, in the correct setting, but I, I, I digress a little bit just to answer your question. Um, so, we, you know, I filed all the reports with the Arizona Livestock Board. I called the Sheriff's Department. I did everything that I could humanly do to try to, you know, shed some light on the situation. It, and excuse what I found me one second, was, John. I'm hearing some yeah. odd noises. You're hearing the dogs. Oh, okay. Are they That's all right? In the background. Yeah, they're fine. But okay. um, periodically, you know, they, they just start whining and it's we okay. again, as long this, as they're all right i just wanted they're fine. to make sure okay. yeah yeah no they're fine um we we get harassed here 24 7 uh by different things and the animals react to it and that's what you're hearing the dogs were reacting um i have four cats and those cats uh constantly patrol the inside of the house and anytime that they see something they attack it uh, they don't attack people, but they attack these beings, and they'll scratch that cat of them. They'll bite them. They'll uh, do anything they can to try to run them off, which Good is kitties. pretty strange behavior for kitties. <laughs> but, I mean, they're they're, they're like watch kitties, you know, but they, they, they like to sleep on a chair in the portal. They love the energy that comes out of the portal, and huh. anytime something is going to go on, they get together and they chase it down. Good as for weird them. As now, that sounds. Now, it doesn't sound weird to us at all, but uh -huh. when did it switch from the attention on the animals and doing the horrible things they did to the animals to you and your wife? About 2007, uh, we started, well, it was even earlier than that. I mean, we've been here since 96. It would have been about 2002 to three that things really shifted from animals to people. And... The very first time that it happened, uh, my wife and I were in bed, and my wife has sleep apnea as well, so she uh, has a tendency to snore real bad. And so she wears a sleep apnea mask. So when she puts on her mask at night and she turns in for the night, I mean, you know, she's out of commission. She's turned off. That's the end of it. She, You couldn't wake her up with, with practically in any way, shape, or form. I'm going to ask hand. you to, to hold that thought because uh, okay. we're going to have to take a very short commercial break and come right back to hear the rest of the story. It's amazing, John. So, again, uh, everybody stay tuned. You are listening to Supernatural Girls Radio. We are speaking with a terrific guest tonight, John Edmonds, and PK and I will be right back.
Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I am here with my co-host, PK, and our amazing guest tonight, John Edmonds from the Alien Ranch. Oh, my God, John. <laughs> <clears throat> this is quite something. Now, we were talking about how the focal point went from hurting your animals and mutilating your animals to coming after you and your wife. So you were talking about your wife having a CPAC system on to help her breathe at night. And what happens from there? Well, actually what happened, Patricia, was the fact that the when they started appearing in the house uh, at about the same time as I was just talking about, that's when we started having you know all the run-ins with them directly. Before that, it was, like I said, directed at the animals. There were things going outside, happening outside, experiences that we really couldn't understand but um we hadn't gotten to the point yet where we were at all fearful for our own lives or uh, or you know just concerned that they were even going to come in the house and then all of a sudden one night uh i my wife was asleep next to me she had her mask on uh and i started sensing that there was something in the room and i thought to myself wow what what is this i hope it's not going to be those same bad guys Unfortunately, it turned out it was. And I had a little aluminum baseball bat that was left over from a Cubs uh, spring training game. And I had that kind of stuck down in the head rail of the or side rail of the bed. And so as these creatures began to kind of come forward, I could see them in a shadowy silhouette kind of way. I waited until one got close enough. And then the next thing I knew, I actually felt this hand on my left forearm. And I thought, well, that's good enough for me. And, you know, I'm not hallucinating, this is for real. And I grabbed that baseball bat and I turned around and I cocked it right in the head as hard as I could. Wow. And, you know, it just literally, it just stood there for a second and it froze and I thought, wow, I thought I hit it pretty hard. And I hit it again. And so I smacked him a second time. And this time it just literally <laughs> just disappeared. It just went and it was gone and I that's thought, Wow, man, I'm good. I really <clears throat> no. nailed it. And uh, but the other two disappeared at the same time. And I rolled over and I shook my wife, and she she growled at me. And I said, <laughs> "Honey, you're not gonna believe this, but we got aliens." And she just she pulled down her mask and she goes, "Really? You, you're gonna wake me up and tell me that we got aliens? Where are they?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, they were just here." And <laughs> And she's like, yeah, right, whatever, go back to sleep, you know. So she rolled over and she went back to sleep. She didn't even take it seriously. You, and, you know what uh, I find so interesting, huh. though? Let me stop you for a second, John, because, you know, most people that have encounters with these aliens, especially like the greys that you've been describing that you first encountered, mm -hmm. they are so uh, unconscious, you know, they, they don't have the wherewithal to grab a bat and smack the crap out of them. You know, they're... they're like out of the, I don't know what they're being treated with. If it's some type of mind control, or some technology that they have that renders them unable to physically attack them. But that doesn't work on you, apparently. I'm from Chicago. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I grew up tough, and you know, on the streets of Chicago, you got to be ready for anything. And uh, you know, so I was. I, I've always, tell my you, whole I, life, I've always you, you been You have ready. a special consciousness that they cannot override, or they would have. So you must have some expanded level of consciousness that allows you almost to meet them at their own level, you know, and that's that's really, really unusual, i got to say. Don't you think, PK? That's yeah. like, you've never heard this before. Amazed at how he's able to handle these things. And still, no, and you know, smack them. Twice, you know, that's great. <laughs> Good for you. Well, you know, and the thing about it is, is we had a, a pit bull named Daisy, and she used to sleep at the foot of the bed uh, on the ground. And she was really cool about it because she knew they were there, and she got up and she tried to, to chase one. And because they always show up in threes, they never come by themselves, they never come, you know, like two of them. There's always three. I don't know what it is about three, but that's how they travel. And uh, she literally almost chased one right through the door. I mean, it, one of them, you know, just took off 
and, and went literally right through a wooden door, a hollow core door. And Daisy hit the door so hard that she actually put a dent in it with her head. Oh, and, no. Poor yeah. Daisy. That's <laughs> yeah. You know, and th this is the same dog that they killed, you know, oh. uh, on 313 of this year. Those so, bastards. You know, God. She was around for a lot of years, and she was a rescue that, you know, came, was very near and dear to me. And, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, it breaks my heart to, to, to know what happened the way it happened, but, you know, it couldn't be prevented. It's horrible. And again, I, I find it so hideous and appalling that they treat animals with this way. It's such incredible disrespect, not only for the animal, but for our feelings towards our animals. It's just unacceptable. So this was the, your first introduction to them, and you were able to get by their mind control and give them a good smack twice with your aluminum baseball bat. So now what? I mean, you must have gotten up in the morning with your wife and, and thought, what are we going to do now? Well, and, and she woke me, you know, she woke me up the, the next day and, and looked at me and she said, did you actually tell me that you smacked an alien? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And, and she says, well, what did you do that for? And I said, well, what do you mean? What did I do that for? They're, they're not supposed to be in the bedroom. And, and she, 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 she just looked at me and she was like, well, tell them to go outside. And I'm like, what do you mean tell them to go outside? They're not supposed to be here at all. Uh, and, you know, but she didn't act real fearful or anything. She, she kind of sort of took it seriously. And we had coffee. And after that, she just, you know, acted like it was no big deal. And I told her, I said, look, this is getting worse and worse. These things have been here on the property. They've been hurting the animals. I said, it's just a matter of time before we're going to start having a lot more problems with these things. And she's like, well, I want to move. And I said, okay, um, that, that's cool. I can understand that. I, I wouldn't mind moving either. But I said, I don't have another million dollars to throw into another ranch someplace. And I said, quite frankly, I don't know if we could get that kind of money for this one. And she's like, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, maybe you should go back to Phoenix and get an apartment next to where your job is. And, you know, I'll try to de-louse the ranch and get rid of all the aliens. <laughs> and then after the coast is clear, you can come back. And but she said, no, nah, I don't want to do that. And I was like, well, OK, then just realize something. I offered to get you an apartment and, you know, take care of you, make you safe and, you know, do everything I could to honor the situation. I said, I had no idea that I was buying a ranch full of aliens. And I said, you know, I'm trying to fix it. So, you know, she got mad at me and for a while she was kind of a grump about it, but she understood that my heart was in the right place and I was trying to do the right thing. And, and you were you protecting know, I, her. Now, did, did has she ever had any physical altercations where she smacked them around too? No, um, she's seen them. She has had them do really bad things where they came up and tried to choke her uh, air hose on oh, her mask. No. And I mean, absolutely turned her blue and then woke up gasping for air. And, you know, I mean, just really terrible things. My wife is a really sweet person, though. She's, you know, and, and quite frankly, I mean, she kind of tried to take the attitude of, well, try to talk to them and, and, you know, try to try to work it out with them. And, you know, I was like, the hell with that. I'm, I'm going to slice and dice. I mean, we're, we're going to. You know, we're going to fight here. And, yeah. you know, I, I mean, I, I tried to be nice to them, but they, they didn't want to, you know, they just, they, they weren't They didn't want to play nice. No, they weren't in a mood. And so the next thing that had to happen was the fact that I had to get rougher with them. And so I kept, you know, trying to figure out a way that I could do even more harm to them to run them off. Um, but, you know, I live in a brick house and it's brick inside as well as outside. And bullets do not go well in a house made of bricks. Right. And so, and I found it out the hard way because I actually, oh. yeah, I actually one day had a, a run in with one and I shot it and the bullet went right through him and it bounced off and it, you know, it was bad. It was really bad. Shit. Plus it almost broke my eardrums. So oh, no. I had to find a solution. The samurai, you know, samurai sword was, was the next step and it works great. It's the ultimate weapon for dispatching little gray aliens. So the next time that the, so they started coming through, they started giving you a hard time, bothering your wife. You bring out the samurai sword to teach them a lesson, and you actually succeeded in stabbing one of them. You ran one through with this thing. I did. Um, my wife was unusual because usually they used to come usually between midnight and 3 a.m., 
and I don't know what happened. I mean, we don't have daylight savings time in Arizona, so I don't know how they could have messed that up. But they, for some reason, showed up about 6 o'clock at night, and three of them showed up literally on our sun porch. And I grabbed the sword. I was just getting ready to go out to feed the dogs and take them out, and I saw these little guys standing there, and I thought, okay, here we go. You know, let's get it on. And I grabbed the sword, and I literally stabbed one right through its abdomen. And when I pulled out the sword, a big chunk came out that was about the size of like a ruby red grapefruit. And then I thought, okay, maybe I can cut the head off, and then I'll have something that I can really prove what I got here. And unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. When I went to swing to take the head, it just disappeared, and the other two disappeared as well. Um, but I still had the, you know, the... Uh, big chunk of, of this particular one on the end of the sword and I had a big puddle of you know fluid that looked like blood or some kind of bodily what color fluid. was it what color Which was one? it the, 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 blood? the fluid um it looks like brake fluid kind of looks like dirty oil um you know it's huh. somewhere between a sort of a dark uh almost a dark red color and a dark like a sort of a syrupy color and the only thing about it is it's very acidic. So it's like if it gets on your skin, it'll burn you. If it gets on cloth, it'll burn right through it. Um, you nice. know, but it, fortunately, I had uh, some glass doors that were right behind me, and the glass doors got pretty well covered with fluid. And so we were able to take a lot of samples from that. And like I said, I had this one big hunk. And so I took it off the sword, and I put it in a glass bottle, and I put it in the freezer. And well, actually, in the refrigerator. And so here I am. Now I got a dead alien in my refrigerator. And you know, <laughs> alien thinking, goo in your refrigerator. Even worse. Yeah. Gosh. And, it's yep. and I, you know, I was like, you know, I, I labeled it, and and some, you know, my wife wouldn't like, you know, make a mistake and you know, cook it up or something. <laughs> and uh, you can imagine. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, here it was. You know, and I had to explain to her what happened, and she was again, she was horrified. But, you know, she was like, thank God I didn't come home a few minutes earlier. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm thinking to myself, i got to do something with this thing. What do I do with it? So I had been working as a producer for the Kevin Smith show. And so, you know, Kevin Smith had on a lot of people that were in the paranormal community, the UFO community. And uh, uh, we, I, I ended up contacting one person in particular, and he helped me to find a scientist that I could talk to. And so uh, Dr. Levengood came into the picture in Grass Lakes, Michigan, and he was somebody that had many, many years of dealing with uh, the uh, animal mutilations. And so he'd studied that and he knew a lot about it. And so he, I contacted him by phone and he was kind of thrilled to hear what I had. And he said, can you send it to me? And I said, okay, how do I send it to you? And he goes, just use FedEx. So. I'm probably the first person who ever FedExed an alien. <laughs> and, uh, alien goo goes FedEx. I love it. Yep. So you, you got and, it there safely into yes, Loving Good's hands. And yep. you actually, on your website, you have some of the results. That's right. right. Yeah. He actually, he had the results for a few months, and he took them to some major universities. And he did, uh, I guess, like what they call, you know, blind box samples, where he didn't tell anybody what they were. He just submitted them to various different schools and asked their departments, uh, you know, to analyze exactly what these tissues were from. And when it came back, you know, he he, uh, he sent me a letter and he said, John, you have the smoking gun of absolute proof of alien visitation on Earth. The samples that were analyzed for DNA and analyzed for cell structure uh, show a remarkable situation in the fact that they show uh, not only hemoglobin, which is contained in blood, but also uh, chlorophyll, which is common in plants. And so literally you have something from the animal kingdom and from the plant kingdom, but they're all in the same thing together, the same sample appearing simultaneously. And that doesn't happen. There's no animal or plant on Earth that that sample could have come from. And so apparently wow. uh, that is the exact, you know, smoking gun proof positive. And Tremendous. we have it. Tremendous. You know? And he was going to release the information with me. We were going to you know, have a big conference or a you know, big news conference and do that. 
And then, unfortunately, something strange happened, and he died. And then a few days later, his wife died. Oh, and no. And so all the samples disappeared. The lab was shut down. And once again, like a you know, typical X-File, um, you know, we didn't get any results. All we got was what we had, and we never got anything past that. And so here we are today. We have, you know, this proof and this evidence and plenty other, but it could have gone a lot further. You know, somehow or another it got somebody intervened and shut it down. What a surprise, right? Yeah, exactly. Now, now I gotta ask you, if you if you have any visits from the men in black. We have. Uh very much so. And, and it's really strange because I didn't even know, you know, really something. I, I was not in the, in, you know, the paranormal UFO community or anything else. You know, I was in the social worker, psychiatric counselor community. I mean, you know, I, I had no idea that there was something called Men in Black. And one day, uh, an SUV, a dark blue SUV, Chevy or GMC SUV pulled up in front of the ranch just south of the front gates and two guys got out and I could see that there were white government plates. And uh, instead of, you know, walking and, you know, up to the gates, they literally just walked right through them. I mean, and the, these gates were locked, okay, and they didn't have a key. And there's no way they could have just swung them open. They just walked right through them. It was like they dematerialized the gates somehow and, and walked through them. And they walked about 50 feet wow. up to where I was standing with a friend of mine uh, because we were actually cleaning guns. And I had a picnic table sitting right there that was underneath a, a, a big shaded area where I parked my cars. And uh, we had about 10 guns on the picnic table that we were just happen to be cleaning and pulling clips in and out of and loading clips and all that good stuff that you do with guns. And uh, these guys walk right up to me and I greeted them and I said uh, who are you and what are you you know what are you doing here and that was a pretty neat trick you did you know with the gates how's that work and these guys had absolutely no expressions on their face they were the color of like uh, like if you went to the grocery store and you bought raw chicken they looked like raw chicken I mean mm -hmm. they were just this sort of whitish Tasty. grayish yeah. yeah it was weird I mean they didn't look human you know they didn't look like regular people they were dressed in black. Actually, they kind of looked like the Blues Brothers, to tell you the truth. And, uh, I mean, that's what they reminded me of, you know, being from Chicago and all. But, uh, um, you know, they, I asked them, I said, what do you want? And they said, you need to stop posting notices of the things that you see on this ranch on the CAUSE website. And Peter Gersten, uh, the UFO lawyer, was kind of big back in those days. And he used to have his own website called the Cause C A U S website, and I used to post everything that I saw, uh, you know, all the strange stuff on the ranch. They put it on his website, and uh, so they told me to stop posting things. They told me basically to, you know, uh, just chill out and stop, you know, talking about anything paranormal. And I just looked at the guy and I said, you know, do you see what's on that table? That table's full of guns. <laughs> and he just looked at me. It didn't bother him at all. Oh, okay. And I just told him, I said, look, you need to get off my property and go away because I don't, you know, I don't take threats well. And I said, you know, you don't have any ID or you, you don't want to show me any ID because I had asked them both for ID and they refused to show me anything. Um, they were clearly here just to make their point and then turn around and leave. And that's what they did. They just spun around on their heels and off they went. And goodbye and good riddance. Gosh. Yep, pretty much. Wow. Now, I've got a whole bunch of questions coming out of the chat room, so I know we're eventually going to answer some of them because we're going to get to what's on your property that these aliens find so enticing. I can and tell that's you that one of the pretty questions. much. Sure. Right I'll now. Be happy to, yeah, yeah I'll be happy to I, answer it. That's what Denise is asking. She's saying, what is it about your property that they're so fascinated with well we have two portals we have one that's a very large portal on the back of the property this is a 10 acre property in the middle of about six or seven hundred thousand acres of wild desert and we have one that is in the living room how convenient right and uh, <laughs> um, they par apparently these portals were here long before anybody built on the property 
you know, long before the Native Americans were here, long before it was used as a uh, basically a dumping ground for uh, artifacts and for um, actually we've dug up skulls, we've dug up all sorts of bones uh, in the process of building things here. And so apparently this, this has been an important property for thousands of years. And during one of the sessions that we had where we uh, had Elizabeth August, who uh, is a person that I work with doing channeling for, you know, through the uh, portal in the living room, um, she's been able to gather all sorts of information about the property and about the things that have actually happened here. And um, one of the answers that came back was that this property, as I said earlier, Arizona has been part of the Egyptian uh, kind of community uh, that was spread out around the world uh, and going back thousands and thousands of years. And so these portals are part of a network of portals. And apparently way, way, way back, uh, the pyramids, portals, there was all sorts of ancient technology that has pretty much long been forgotten now. And, uh, but it was all in use back then. And so these gates or these portals are left over from that period. Now you also have an aquifer with yes. very special water and you also have a mineral on your property that comes from, I think you said lightning has something to do with the formation of it. Fulgurite, well, is that it? Yeah, yeah, we have fulgurite. Um, we because we live in a bowl, more or less, in terms of we're surrounded by the Australia Mountains. Um, when a storm gets in the bowl, it just goes around and around and around. And so, when we have lightning storms, which we have frequently, um, it strikes the ground a lot. And so, because of that, we have the fulgurite because that's how fulgurite is made. It, it's actually. Um, sand and, and other materials that when they come in contact with extreme energy, uh, it creates fulgurite. So there's a number of things that are attractive. You've got the two portals, you've got the fulgurite, you've got the aquifer with the special water. So it sounds like you've got all the right elements to keep drawing well, them in. Yeah, we're like paranormal Walmart. I mean, you know, we have it all. I mean, One stop shopping. How can <laughs> they beat it? Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's it. And we got everything but a drive through God. <laughs> you may have a drive through You just haven't found it yet. Yes, so, sir. oh, my goodness. <laughs> Yes. Well, now I wanted to remind everybody uh, to go to irnchat.com, irnchat.com. Go to the menu, click on tube, and you can see us. Because I want John to show everybody that beautiful samurai sword. We got to see it earlier, but I think you're going to want to see it too. And we've got so much more to talk about tonight. And we've got a big reveal coming up regarding North Korea. There it is. It's the sword. Oh, my God. Look at that. Sharp as can be. Uh, I'll get up close. You can actually see that it you. still has, it still has, uh, oh, I, I think you can see some of the discoloration on it. Yeah. Is that alien That, that is alien, alien, alien goo. What? <laughs> alien pet <that> stuff. <laughs> yep. Okay, we got to go to a break. Everybody, stay tuned. You're listening to Supernatural Girls Radio. Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I am here with my co-host, PK, and our amazing guest this evening, John Edmonds from the Alien Ranch. So we are, we just saw your beautiful sword. It's amazing. And again, I think these aliens are crazy to mess with you. But here's a question from someone in our chat room called Publius, who is asking, do you feel you're being monitored by the government? I absolutely am. Every phone call I have, every show I do, I've literally been on my computer uh, during a show because I had my own show for 12 seasons uh, called Adventures into the Strange. And uh, one day when I was doing my show, uh, suddenly the screen changed in front of me and this guy from the CIA showed up and it said literally his name on his desk. It had a picture of the CIA behind him. And, I, and I, I mean, I looked at him and he looked at me and he smiled 
And he waved at me, and I waved back at him, and then he went away. <laughs> I was like, wow. Incredible. That's yep. too funny. Uh, I just want to mention, PK, your room's getting foggy again. I noticed that. I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, oh, God, is it me? Here we go again. Yeah. My vision, and it is. It's you. It's, I mean, it's your room. There's something happening, and in, in the energy in your room is shifting. Everybody watching us on video right now should be able to see it, that PK's room was crystal clear before, yeah. and now it isn't. So something's going on over there. So we're going to keep tagging pictures, see what we can capture. Now, John, uh, you also had an offer from a lady who said she would bring to your property good aliens to help you out, to try to shift things for the better. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It sounds fascinating about what happened. Well, <clears throat> as you know, the confrontation situation got worse and worse. I, I got more and more just upset about it and I you know I felt bad because it, eventually I had to uh, close down my practice as a counselor and a therapist because I didn't feel that it was fair for me to be taking people's hard-earned money and then turn around and you know kill aliens at night and live on an alien ranch and then try to provide you know a real professional environment uh, th those things just don't go together you know in, in the uh, counseling community and so I thought okay I'm going to resigned my position, uh, you know, shut it down, and I did do that. Um, but, you know, that was a tremendous thing for me because I'd been a counselor and a very good one for a long time and been very successful at it. And I thought, you know, I've got to find a way to get an answer here. So I kept putting questions out on the Internet to various different chat rooms and various different uh, email chains of, of people that were in the paranormal community. Finally, I got a call from a lady uh uh, named Dr. Brandy is what she goes by, and her real name is uh, Brandy Howe. And she said that she had been contacted by a lady and asked to go out to the ranch and help us out of the situation we were in. And so I was thrilled. I was like, man, anybody who's you know crazy enough to come out here, you know, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna take them really? up on it. Thank you very and much. So yes. She, you know, she came out. Uh, she came out from Phoenix, and she had two individuals with her. And, you know, to just to look at them, pretty much they all look pretty normal, um, except for the fact they were dressed a little strangely and they were uh, quite large people. And I thought, well, you know, can't, beggars can't be choosers. Let's just go with what we got. And I greeted them. We went in the house and Dr. Brandy started going through the house. Uh, and, you know, Dr. B was looking at, at uh, all the different rooms and and. She could sense that there was a lot of negative energy in the house, and she said she thought that the spirit of a young male was still here. And, in fact, there was a man, a young man, that had been the son of one of the families that had lived here, and he had committed suicide in the living room the day before he graduated from high school. Okay, everybody, we are now back on the air. All of a sudden, we went dark and everybody got kicked off. However, we have a great producer named Joe Champion, and he got us back on the air. Now he's working to get John Edmonds back with us. We are watching all kinds of phenomenon going on here tonight. Uh, PK's room, if you've tuned into the video, you can see that her whole room is getting foggy, and there's no fog. No, <laughs> I look around the room. Fog. Clear as a bell, outside clear as a bell, except what you're visualizing here, it's foggy. It's foggy, it's foggy. And so I was taking pictures and all of a sudden the screen shifted and started showing all of the theater chairs behind me. So I took a bunch of pictures and bam, we were off the air. John, I can see you now, you're back with us? Hi, hey, John. I hope so. Welcome yeah, back. That, was, that was pretty wild. Okay, you can always kind of wild things going on on Supernatural Girls. So <clears throat> you had this lady contact you. Let's get back to the most important part of this. And she actually brought real extraterrestrials, uh, corporeal ones, to your ranch. And you guys had a long conversation. 
on your ranch, John? They spent three or four hours with us. And at first I was very skeptical because I didn't know Dr. B. And so I had no reason to believe anything that, that was going on, that it was absolutely real. And, uh, you know, so I kind of wanted to test it and, and make sure as best I could of what I was dealing with. And uh, so I started asking them a lot of questions. And I had uh, already had a list, as strange as it sounds, of questions in my own mind about things that I, if I ever met an ET, that I was going to ask. And, you know, I, you know I, I know that sounds preposterous, but I always thought to myself, if you ever run into an ET, there's certain things you ought to ask. And so, you know, I, I had a list. And uh, they started, they were very happy to answer questions. They were very uh, decent with us. They, they, um, they took their time and explained things because a lot of the references and things that they explained, it, you know, my wife and I just looked at each other like, you know, this doesn't make any sense. You know, we didn't know anything about what they were talking about. But they, they were very gracious with us, and they answered our questions, you know. And um, I wanted answers to questions that I considered to be questions humanity needed answers to. And as we began to get to know each other a little bit, um, I told them, I said, you know, one of the things that, that I think is terrible is the fact that we're living in an age when we have all this pollution. And I would like to get answers to being able to straighten out the pollution. And one of the things that they asked me about was they said, well, what do you think the worst kind of pollution is? And I said, well, probably radiation. And they agreed with me and they said, well, you know, there's absolutely no good reason why you're dealing with the radiation problems that you're dealing with. And I said, well, how is that? And they said, well, if you go back to like 1968 or 1969, your government had two choices as far as plutonium or another element that they could have used to uh, fuel the nuclear reactors that they built in America. And I said, well, why would that have made a difference? And the way they explained it was is that the other element that they mentioned to me was an element that would burn 40 times more powerful, produce 40 times as much power, but it could not be weaponized. It could not be, it couldn't pollute. I mean, you could walk right up to it in its raw form and or even after it had been used in a rod that was put into a nuclear reactor and it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt anybody and i said well why didn't the government choose to use those and the answer was they couldn't weaponize it they couldn't mm. use it to create a product right. that they, they could have. use as a yeah exactly and Jeez. so they chose not to use it and the models of those reactors became the models for every reactor around the world afterwards and so today we are living with all of Fukushima and all of these problems with all these different, you know, countries that want weapons, they want nuclear plants. You know, you've got, you know, what, Iran, you've got North Korea, you've got, you know, all these different places with all the, these uh, dictators. And they're all trying to become superpowers. And it never had to happen. And we still have today the ability to be able to take all these reactors and utilize that other fuel source and convert them over. So I got to thinking to myself, well, if that's the case, you know, let's look at North Korea and the situation we're in right now. Why couldn't we just say to North Korea, okay, guys, we understand that you want to join the 21st century and have access to, you know, relatively inexpensive and plentiful power to be able to do all the things that you want for your country. We understand that. That's fairly reasonable. What we don't like is the fact that you guys also want to make weapons and you want to threaten people, and that's not acceptable. So what if we were to create a situation where you could have as much nuclear power as you want using this other element and build your reactors and create everything that you say you want to do with your society, and we'll help you. Okay? Now we're not in a position where we're fighting each other anymore or we're arguing with each other anymore. Instead, what we're doing is, is we're making it possible for them to have what they want because what they want can't threaten us and it can't threaten the world. And it can be done safely and it can be done in a, in a sense of community and cooperation. And see, one of the biggest problems that the aliens have with us is the fact that, you know, the first thing we always fall back on is, oh, gee, we've been threatened. Let's make a bigger threat. And, you know, let, let, let's just, you know you know, lock heads and egos and everything else and have all these disagreements and violence and death and everything else. 
And that kind of thing's been going on on this planet for, you know, a couple of thousand, two or three thousand years at least. And so, you know, we have the ability to create a solution here. I think we should probably look at it real hard. Well, definitely should look at it. I mean, we're at the on the edge right now. So this is a brilliant idea. And we certainly appreciate you revealing this on our show because it's a very important thing to consider. Now, these aliens, I know people are asking me, what did they look like? Did they look like us? Pretty much. I mean, the ones that we met look like us. Uh, like I said, they were rather large. Uh, there were two races that, that in this particular case, excuse me, I got a fly in here. Um, <laughs> they're, they're uh, you know, they were, both men were well over six feet tall, probably six, three, six, four. Um, looked like they could have been like linebackers for an NFL team. Um, they were almost too perfect looking. That's one of the things that I've noticed about the ETs that I've met. They always look like they, they just rolled out of like a, you know, a modeling show someplace in Hollywood and that they're, they're just, they're too good looking, you know, and I don't know why that is. I don't know if that's something that's been contrived or maybe they just got really good genes or they've got control over those genes or something. But they're, they're incredibly good-looking people. They, they all look like they like they, they just rolled out of GQ or, you know, uh, something like that. Well, I guess if they're given a choice of what they're going to look like, they picked uh, something attractive, which is interesting. So, my gosh, you are a wealth of information because you've had so many different experiences with so many races of ETs, and you've seen the ships also. Yes, flying around on your ranch have you been in the ships no um the the interesting thing that one of the things is we kind of wound down with these guys after they answered a lot of questions because i really kind of stuck it to them i mean i i really tried to i knew it might not be something that i was going to have a chance to do again and so what i tried to do was get as much information as i could the first time around and uh I said, look, guys, for me, the clincher is going to be I need to see like a big old spaceship someplace and I need to be able to, you know, satisfy myself that, that all the information you've given me, not only is it real, but for me, this is going to be the one big thing. And they said, well, we can show you a ship. That's not a problem. And I was like, wow, cool. So my wife and I, we went outside. We sat down on the tailgate of my Ford pickup truck and we waited for the show to start. And these guys looked at me and they said, look over here to your left across the street where the mountains are. And my wife and I centered our attention across the street. We looked and lo and behold, a ship that was like the size of like an NFL stadium rolled out of the clouds. It had its own weather pattern right around it. I mean, there were like storm clouds and, and you know, thunder and, and, you know, little bits of lightning and stuff going on around it. It was that big and that intense. It was absolutely huge. It had to be like Incredible. five or six stories, you know, high. And it was, it was, I've never seen anything like it, any place in the world that was that big. And we, my wife and I just looked at each other and I said, do you see what I see? And she said, do you see a giant spaceship? And I said, <laughs> yeah. That's and what I'm goes, seeing. Well, then we're either having the same exact hallucination or we're both seeing this thing for real. And, you know, we, we just stood there and our, or sat there and our mouths were just wide open. And then the ship kind of pulled back into the cloud bank. And one of the aliens said to me, look to the south. And we looked to the south, which was right in front of us. And from one horizon all the way to the other horizon, it was just the same ships, like, you know, like edge to edge all the way across the horizon. And there must have been dozens of them. I don't know how many there were, but they were just there. And there was this huge red, you know, setting sun right behind them. And it was just very impressive. Incredible. And then before we could even get used to that, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, was this horrific storm. I mean, Arizona has what they call monsoons, where they yes. have like these tremendous dust storms with rain and thunder and wind that just blow up out of nowhere. And that's exactly what happened. And I mean, this was so intense. I can honestly say in all the years I've been here, I've never seen a storm come up that quickly, almost instantly, and, and that severely. And so uh, Dr. B, she uh, was standing there with these, these guys, maybe 50 or 60 feet away from us. And all of a sudden, a giant 
uh, bolt of lightning came down and struck the ground from right next to her. It was purple lightning, and I've never seen purple lightning. I've always seen, like, yellow lightning or white lightning or something like that. Never seen purple lightning. And it hit the ground, and she reacted, and the other two reacted, and they just ran over and got in her car, and she waved at me, and she drove away. <laughs> and I thought, well, that was a really weird day. I mean, you talk about wow. a strange, strange afternoon. And the two guys that beamed down, they just disappeared. I don't even know what happened to them. Out so they went. They now, just went back they, to their ship. One very important element that I, I heard you share about these uh, aliens, they want to disclose their presence, right? Well, you see, that was the whole thing. I am during the course of the afternoon that we had this conversation. Um, you know, I asked them. I said, "Well, you know, this is—is is this a one-time deal, or can we get together on a regular basis and, and keep talking?" Because you know, I got a lot more questions, and quite frankly, you know, I haven't really been that fair with you guys. I've been kind of severe, and you know, I like to make it up to you. And uh, you know, so we were able to get together a couple of times after that. Uh, different members of different races. And here in, in Phoenix, there seems to be some kind of, of draw for all these different races. And there's something about Arizona, there's something about Phoenix that keeps pulling, pulling these individuals here for some reason. And so uh, there's quite a few of them here. So it's, it's you know, something that, that I, you know, I guess it can continue to be repeated but what I, one of the things that I found out about working with aliens, and that is, is that it's kind of like herding cats. Um, you know, they'll tell you they'll do something. They'll tell you they're going to do something. But a lot of times it's really hard to get them to follow through. You no Because I wanted to have, well, I wanted to have like a, you know, I wanted to have like a big news conference here at the ranch. And, you know, I have the big flying saucer overhead and, you know, have all the, the you know, people that I invited be there. And I thought, man, this is going to be epic, you know, hey, yeah. and and just trying to get them here. Forget it. And it was like, no kidding. Yeah. Well, I, they just, you know, you get one group to agree to something and then another group has a problem with something else. And before you know it, nobody's happy and everybody's kind of, you know, not working together. And yeah. I thought to myself, isn't this kind of like a human thing? You know, it doesn't it sound that way? Yes. But, and, and it really, it really was. But I haven't given up hope yet because I know that they want certain things accomplished and I'm working on those things. So, you know, that's what the ranch is really all about. It's taking a really miserable, bad situation that, that almost everybody would have run away from and flipping it over and turning it into something that's an example of, you know, peace and, and you know, hopefully prosperity and, you know, good things for everybody and something that the world can get something out of. And, and that's what I'm trying to do. You know, I'm just trying to take something that nobody in their right mind would want to be around and turn it into something that everybody can get something good out of. That'd be wonderful. John, you're a very special person, a, a very, very special person, to be able to do what you're doing. And you're so right. I mean, so many people would have run screaming into the night with this kind of thing and never looked back. <laughs> You and know? they have. <laughs> yeah, and they have. That's right. We've had some visitors that have done that. <laughs> <laughs> but you're you're so generous of spirit, so large of heart, and all of these wonderful things you're doing with the ranch to allow people to have this experience if they're grounded enough to have it. And it, that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing that you're, you're offering. And you, we all know disclosure is never going to come from our government because there's no benefit to them. Right? No, there really isn't. I mean, the situation with disclosure, if you really think about it, it it's kind of like uh, if they admitted that they've been holding back on this for decades, everybody would be looking at them and saying, so why should we trust you now? And yeah. they'd also be saying, you know, they'd be saying, so what else were you lying to us about? That's and, right. You know, so, we're saying that anyways, but it would be worse. Thing. We're yeah. doing it anyway. But, but that's, <laughs> that's the point, right. you know, and I, I've, you know, I've been asked about this a few times. And I say the only way that disclosure could really happen would be if it came either like what we're doing, which is kind of grassroots, where we're just, you know, we're just taking what we got and working with it and inviting people to participate and learn from it. And, and let's face it, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's kind of a weird curve because folks not only have to get used to the idea that, you know, we're not the not only 
you know, maybe we're the dominant species on this planet in terms of numbers, but that yeah. doesn't mean that we're dominant in terms of uh, how long we've been here uh, or more important or, or anything else. You know, we have a lot to learn. You know, we not only yes, need to do. learn from them, but we need to learn from each other. And part of that is just participating and doing it. And so, yes. you know, I ask everybody just to open their hearts, open their minds, you know, and, and accept the fact that the only way forward is going to be through peace. It's going to be, you know, literally through through love and, and through kindness. And I, I don't think anything else is going to work because we literally have to prove that we can get along. And so far, that's the hardest possible thing. We can send a man to the moon. We can cure cancer. We can do anything. But the one thing we don't seem to be able to do on a regular basis is get along with each other. Well, that's and, true. And I, I think we need to show these ETs how it's done. You know, we need to come together and start expanding our consciousness to that degree. And I, I want to go ahead and announce your website again, both of them. Sure. So for people, everybody, we're really asking you to dig deep into your pockets. Please donate to John's endeavor here. It is called Hopeful Hooves, H-O-O-V-E-S dot Org. And that is his nonprofit. It's a 501c3. You can donate, take a tax deduction, and you'll really be helping out a good cause. And his other website is alienranch.weebly, W E E B L Y dot com. You can contact John through that website as well. And John, we got to have you come back. This has been. A wonderful evening with you. You're terrific. It's it's just great. Everything you're doing, we support. And uh, anything you need from us, you just let us know. And we're just we're going to put you on the list to come back and tell us more because we know you have so much more to share with us, and we have such a short period of time with you tonight. But thank you so much. God bless. And next week. We're talking to Dr. J about Bigfoot. So don't miss that, everybody. And until then, we'll see you on the Blue Highway. Good night. Thank you.